Realm presents The Villa, Salvation, Episode 4. Asala's jet jolted as it touched down onto the landing field. She propped open her side door and stared up at a sky still thick with clouds. Asala tapped the chin of her helmet, and her visor rolled up over her head, leaving her wide open to the elements. The rain pelted her in the face, and it felt like she would never escape this storm. A terrain jeep ambled toward her, its floodlights blinding her until it came to a stop. Asala took a quick note of the design. It was a downloaded model, much like everything else on base. She wondered how much the settlement had managed to 3D print these past few months. Definitely enough to create the infrastructure for a small town. The driver's side window rolled down, A very short woman leaned out, for some reason bursting with enthusiasm. Only the stars knew why. Are you Asala? She said in Upper Crescent, although she did not bear the clan tattoos of Hypatia. Asala nodded. As far as I know, I was the only one slotted to arrive this hour. The woman shrugged. Yes, well, it's only customary for me to ask. Welcome to Salvation. We just named it last week by community vote, she said proudly. Asala spit out the rainwater that ricocheted into her mouth. Salvation, she muttered under her breath, her tongue somehow rejecting the sound of it. Asala was overly cautious, a master of cynicism. Yet there was a part of her that hoped this woman was right, and that she had chosen wisely by coming here. The woman stared at the state of Asala's jet, fragments of jagged glass somehow still hanging onto the metal frame where the cockpit window used to be. You have trouble coming in? Asala glanced back up at the spiteful sky. You think? The woman's smile never cracked, despite Asala's admittedly unpleasant demeanor. Asala had good reasons. It was late. She had just survived a massive electromagnetic storm, and her wet hair was stuck to her face. Jump in, the woman said. The heavies will grab your cargo in the morning. She'd rather have dealt with her gear right then and there, but the rain would be a real obstacle. Let me just grab a few things. Asala took a step back inside the cruiser and unhooked the packed bungee strapped to one of the walls. She unclasped the top, and took a quick peek inside, making sure that her arm cannon was there, along with a few sets of charge cubes, as well as another narrow equipment box underneath. When she turned back outside, the passenger door to the terrain jeep was already open. Asala jumped in. I'm me. The woman extended her forearm in greeting, and Asala knocked her own forearm against hers. Asala had never met Neve before today, but she did know her name from her files. Neve was one of several refugee scientists from Camp Gala who had managed to cross during the evac. She, along with many of the refugees, broke off from the rest of the survivors early on, leaving Orbit Base to build the settlement down below and help gather research. To any unknowing bystander, it was a diplomatic decision made in the spirit of scientific advancement and cooperation. But really, it was fueled by the refugees' desire to finally be free of Gandesian oppression. Perhaps that was why Neve was smiling when she met her. She saw Asala's high passion markings, a tattoo that not only indicated where she was from, but oftentimes clued people in to where she stood in this whole political mess. Asala had lived as a mercenary, She had no alliances except to herself and her blood family. But that didn't mean she didn't have enemies, like the Gandesian General Sinri. The Gandesians had never been on Asala's good side. They were like annoying tanglewood. They never wanted to step in it. It was hard to get rid of. At least she didn't have to worry about them down here on the ground. She was looking forward to calmer days ahead. Once this blasted storm blew over. Neve hit the drive function, reactivating the jeep's main battery, and they zoomed off. 
Masala peered through the front glass, which was fogging up from the rain. She wiped it off with her hand, but even then it was hard to make out what was outside, except for a few hazy perimeter lights coming up the road. It isn't always like this, Neef said. At least we have a lot of fresh water to go around. It's a glass half full scenario. So, what brings you down here? I bet you're looking to settle down. Asala grunted, trying to dodge out of the conversation, even though Neve pretty much had her pegged. Asala didn't want to get into her own personal life decisions. She just met the woman. The base was about a five-minute drive, and soon they passed the cement blocks and metal fencing that marked the perimeter. Pretty heavy-duty barriers, Asala observed. Neve nodded, without an explanation. Good thing I brought a weapon, Asala thought. By the time they pulled in, the rain had lulled from water pellets to an annoying mist. She got out, her feet sinking into the mud. So this is ground... Indeed it is. For few of us, it was a first. Some of the refugees had never even set foot on organic ground before. It's been a while since I have myself... Asala admitted. Her bones felt the weight of the planet's gravity. It had a different feel than the artificial grav force created in orbit base. Dio, being the good war soldier that she was, had ordered the carrier ship to run under a Code 9. The ship and its crew had to be ready for battle at all times. Dio sectioned off a good portion of the power that should have gone to the gravity systems into defense protocol. All weapons had to be ready to go. Fighter jets had to be charged. Orbit couldn't run in full grav at that state. The whole place would have a power crash. So the feel of weight in her limbs, her feet half sunk in the mud, was downright nostalgic. Asala curled her fingers together in a fist. Real gravity made it easier to punch someone in the face and have it hurt. Really hurt. Not that she was going to punch Neve right here and now, but Asala knew her strengths. She was better equipped for combat on land-based terrain. Asala scanned the structures surrounding the base's public circle. Like any good agent, she noted all of the exit routes before anything else. And there were quite a few of them, which meant this place wasn't as protected as she thought it'd be. I'm sure you're tired, Neymph said. I'll walk you to your quarters. Wait, Asala stopped her. A heavenly scent drifted toward her, prominently smoky despite the humid air. What's that smell? That? Neymph smiled her toothy grin. That's food? Well, Asala thought, maybe this is salvation after all. Asala grabbed the bone by hand and bit in, the juicy meat almost melting in her mouth. Oh, gods, she said slowly. It had been ages since she had something this fresh. Do you eat like this every day? Neve nodded. We have a discovery team that goes out into unexplored terrain. They collect specimens and then grill them. After our data has been compiled, yes, Neymph answered. Can't waste good meat. We came across this flock in a nearby field. There were hundreds of them. Asala couldn't help but think about the extinction of the Barbox, a warm-blooded, scaled equine from the northern pole of Kayam. They'd roamed the plains in three giant herds, each consisting of hundreds of thousands. It only took two decades to completely wipe them out by excessive hunting. She hoped that the residents of Ground would learn from this mistake. The meat was mighty tasty, though, and she savored the piece in her hand down to the bone. So you've been exploring the territory. Anything of concern? Neve shook her head. Not that we know of. We have ecologists on staff doing comprehensive observations. There's an abundance of water, as you already know. 
a healthy variety of flora and fauna that we could possibly cultivate and domesticate. What more could we want? Any signs of advanced civilizations? None, Neef replied. By our observations, there's no real danger here. Asala took a sip of her shine, letting the harsh liquid warm up her throat. She mulled over Neef's words, no real danger. For some reason, that was hard to believe. So everything here is perfect. Well, nothing is perfect, Asala, Neef drawled, then peered over at a group at another table, her voice a bit louder now. Like my ex-girlfriend sitting over there with a scowl on her face. The ex scowled at them even harder. She hates this place. She doesn't want to be here, Neef said. Or maybe it's because she doesn't want to be near me. Asala reached for the open bottle of shine and poured Neef another glass. Drink up, she said. Seems like you need this more than me. After dinner, Neef drunkenly guided Asala to her temporary quarters, a shipping container residence that was fitted with the basic necessities. A kitchen console, a separate bathing unit sectioned off from the room, and the most important thing of all, a bed. It was a comfortable foam futon on a warmer platform with a synth-weave comforter rolled neatly atop a tiny cylindrical pillow. She sent Neev off before the inebriated scientist could vomit all over the floor, and after watching her stumble across the public square, Asala finally closed the door. She hung up her jacket and placed her pack by the entryway after taking out her arm cannon. She always slept with a weapon under her pillow. A quick glance around the room showed her possible exits in case of attack. There was the obvious one, the front door. Asala banged on the wall paneling. The material was thin, so she could blast through them if she was in a pinch. Her eyes set on the front window, looking into the square. Another easy exit. But what stood out more than an escape plan was the state of her accommodations. She narrowed her eyes at the layer of dirt and growth gunking up every corner and coating every surface. The sink was filled with old dishes, and the trash cycler was packed with waste that had started to sour. On top of that, some sort of overgrowth of red flora clung to the frames of the windows. Sala scraped at it with her finger, but it crumbled away like powder, making an even bigger mess. She grumbled, knowing she wouldn't be able to sleep like this. She folded up her sleeves and got to work, scrubbing at the counters, sweeping up the dirt on the floor, coughing at the plume of red dust clinging to the air as she cleaned. By the time she was done, the place looked good as new, and it gave her a glimmer of what she could do with a place of her own. What she could show Dio, if her sister would let her. A yawn fought its way out of her body, as sleep reached out its grubby hands and tugged her back to the center of the room. That futon was calling for her, and she was going to sleep like the dead. Asala opened her eyes and she was somewhere else. The world was a gradient of white, snow-filled fields stretched to a horizon that eventually touched a graying sky that grew darker and darker as she looked up. Immediately, she knew where she was. It was a place from her past. Her passions had at least a hundred words for what was known to everyone else as snow. One word for every kind of texture and thickness and even off-shade color of the frozen precipitation. As their system's sun started to dull and their climate cooled, snow had become very much a part of their everyday life. It made sense to give it several different names. Asala looked up at the flurry of kafkai that floated down. These were not delicate snowflakes, but large clumps that had weight to them. She held out her hand, which was strangely tiny even within its puffy glove. When the kavkai hit her palm, it scattered for a few seconds, then reformed. Like it was stuck, 
in a loop. Come now! A familiar voice called from behind her. Asala wanted to call out in response, but she felt a resistance, like she was no longer in control of her words and actions. She was a mere passenger in this body as it followed the voice through the dense snowfall. Here! Over here! Asala peered through the white sheen until she saw a shape crouched by a very sad tree. Help me with these! A young girl wrapped up in furs peeled bark off the trunk. She wore a thick cap with ear flaps and a hand-me-down shawl buttoned tightly around her nose and mouth, leaving only a sliver of space in between for her dark brown eyes. Ice had started to form on her eyelashes. It wasn't customary to wear a wrapping, but during a blizzard this thick, they had to keep the air in their lungs from freezing. Asala drew in a deep breath. She knew this girl. It had been a long time since she had seen this girl. Dayu, Asala said her sister's name, and her voice was small, the voice of a child. It's cold. But despite her complaints, she felt happiness. It was a joy so strong that she ignored the strangeness of this experience. Here, there was no salvation, no orbit, no evac. They had all melted away until she was left with just this. Together, standing with Dio in this blank white field, Asala would never be alone. Dio gathered the wood strips and divided them between the two of them. We'll be warm soon. Soon. Warm. Dio's words melted. And so did time. Asala found herself in a small room, big enough for the two of them to lie down to rest. The room had no windows where heat could escape. Even so, she felt cold. It was a cold that was unimaginable. Painful. At the far end of the room, Dio was smaller than before, now stripped of all the warm layers she wore earlier. Her arms were skinny, and so was the rest of her like she hadn't eaten a full meal in a while. A book filled with Dio's smudged handwriting lay open at her feet. Her sister crouched before a small steel oven, setting fire to the dry wood. It caught easily, and she stared into the orange light for a few seconds, as if to make sure it wouldn't slip away from her. It's not enough, Asala heard her sister say quietly to the small flame. She reached for her book and tore the first page. What are you doing? Asala asked, frightened. And she was genuinely frightened. It was worse than the cold. No, Dayo. Those are ours. Asala scrambled over to her sister, trying to stop her. But the book in Dayo's hands was already ripped apart. The shredded pages curled in the pit of the stove. Dayo looked back at Asala. The ice on her eyelashes had long melted, falling down her cheeks. It almost looked like she was crying. See? It feels warm. That's my job, to keep you warm. Asala watched the fire as the words on the paper burned to ash. She read these poems every night before she went to sleep. The ones her sister had written. A treasure gone disappeared. We're going to have to leave here, Dio said as she stared into the fire. Asala's breath flew out of her in tiny white clouds. But this is our home. No, her sister whispered as she stroked the downy hair along Asala's forehead. Not anymore. Wait, this wasn't how she remembered it. Had this memory always been this sad? They were together. That was all they needed to be happy, together through anything. And soon Asala was no longer a child. The room was now too small, and the walls pushed toward her, boxing her in. She couldn't breathe. Stop. No more. The walls. The ceiling. The ground. 
the sides of a coffin. Dio! She screamed, pounding against the walls. Dio's words drifted toward her. We are going to leave here. But this is our home. That was what Asala had said in return. This time, she said nothing. The ground fell from beneath her, and she was weightless. Wake up! A voice screamed through the black, and she felt her world shake. Asala's eyes opened slowly. A swatch of gridded metal filled her vision, even panels held together with exactly 24 bolts. Neev leaned into view, interrupting the flow of the metal above her. Her lips formed syllables. Asala! This was the point when Asala remembered exactly where she was. That she was at ground, and the metal grid above her was the ceiling. She was awake, but she didn't feel awake. A horrible weightlessness grabbed hold of her, as if she were hovering somewhere between earth and sky. Something was wrong. Raise your neck. Use your arms. Sit. Get up. No matter how many mental commands she sent to her body, she couldn't rouse herself from the state she was in. It was as if she were paralyzed. Neev disappeared from view, only to return seconds later with a metal canister. She had ended it over Asala's head, and the water from inside slapped her skin in a shock of cold. Immediately, all motor function was back, her nerves instantly hot-wired. Asala spit the water out and sat up, gasping. Neve's eyebrows were set in stern lines, unlike the jovial high arches that Asala was getting used to seeing. I came in here to offer you some tea, and I couldn't wake up, Asala sputtered. I just couldn't. Gravity fatigue. It happened to all of us when we got here. Some of us haven't even adjusted yet. That's why I wanted to check in on you. Neve tossed her a towel and Asala slowly rubbed it across the short length of her hair, using this moment to catch her breath and manage her heart rate to a normal pace. When she was dry enough, Neve placed a warm cup in Asala's hands. The tin cylinder felt nice against her skin. The fragrance of the tea wafted up, sharpening her senses. It all made sense. Her body was dealing with the new weight of gravity. Her organs and muscles would be working more than she was used to. Until her body completely adjusted, even sitting idle would tire her out. Yeah, gravity fatigue. That was all it was. All of a sudden, a loud boom tore toward them, rattling the thin sheet metal of her container residence. Outside, somewhere very close by, plumes of angry smoke rose to the sky. Her reflexes quickened alert, Asala grabbed for the arm cannon underneath her pillow. She kept her head low, out of view from the window. She glanced over at Neve. Keep it behind me, Asala instructed. Head down. Asala crawled to the window and took a quick peek out the bottom corner. She narrowed her eyes at the veil of smoke in the distance, trying to discern the figures running under its cover. Sparks of gunfire ignited on all sides, and from where she was, she could smell the crisp scent of charge smoke. It was a firefight. The camp was under attack. What happened to Nodinja, Niev? Asala nodded to the site outside. That out there? I'm pretty sure that qualifies as God's damn danger. Niev hesitated. It's nothing we can't handle. It was then that Asala remembered the high walls surrounding the compound, with more guard lights shining out into the unknown than in. Despite what she'd been led to believe, this place was not as safe as it seemed. She grabbed Neve's wrist. I don't like liars. What's going on here? Please. Neve made no move to struggle against her. I'm not the enemy here. Then who is? I thought you said you haven't encountered any native civilizations. We haven't, Neve said. It's one of us. Masala's eyes grew wide. She began assembling the arm cannon so it fit comfortably around her palm and wrist, knowing full well that she would have to use it. She cocked the trigger, hearing the ready hiss of her weapon. 
tell me everything you know about them. Not long after we landed, a small faction of our camp became... Neath tried to find the word... belligerent. Sala didn't like that word, because she was that word. What do they want? They're raiders. They come here sometimes, break in, steal our supplies. Why hadn't they sent up reports of this? Asala should have been briefed before she arrived. But she already knew why. Ground and Orbit didn't exactly see eye to eye. Asala grabbed her pack and slung it over her shoulder. She headed for the door. Where are you going? Neve asked. She was still crouched on the ground, her fingers intertwined behind her head as if something would soon collapse on them. Aren't you going to help us? Asala shook her head. She was pissed. I didn't sign up for this. She'd had enough of fighting. Enough of putting her life on the line for the sake of civilians, for people she'd just met. It was all about her life now. Her future. And that meant staying alive. She just needed to get back to her cruiser, find a decent spot with a decent view where she could hoist up the walls of her forever home and live in peace. With a twist of the handle, Masala opened the door to the smell of chemical charge and brimstone. Outside, the sparks of gunfire had died down. A few people emerged from the haze, wearing the green and khaki uniforms of the base. Masala walked out, keeping her footsteps light and her weapon ready. She kneeled beside a young man who had fallen from the battle. Blood poured out of a wound at his shoulder, already caking up the dirt on the ground. What's your name? Oba, he whispered. Oba, focus now. She captured his eyeline. Did they retreat? He coughed before shaking his head. No. She glanced around at her surroundings. If they didn't retreat, then where the hell are they? Masala thought back to the few things she knew. Neve had said they were raiders. Maybe they hadn't gotten everything they came here for. Her heart rate quickened. She knew where they might be heading, but she had to be sure. She looked back to see Neve watching her cautiously from the residence container. Please tell me you unloaded my cargo somewhere safe. Masala didn't have to see Neve's face to know. Grab your keys, she said. You're driving. Can't this thing go any faster? Masala yelled over the hum of the L engine. This is the fastest terrain jeep we have, Neve said as she navigated the vehicle on the dirt road back to the landing field. Asala needed to reclaim her cargo before the raiders got to her supply. But she wouldn't be able to, not at this pace. She had to make this rig go faster. Asala crawled out of her seat and made her way back into the flatbed. Neve swiveled her head, taking quick glances back at her. I don't think you should be back there. It's not safe. Safe? Asala had to hold back a laugh. It had been a while since she played it safe. Watch their road, Neve turned back to the wheel. Oh, crap, Neve said quietly then. Hold on. The jeep swerved. Masala crashed into the side paneling. Sorry, fallen branch, big one. You okay back there? Neve asked once the jeep was back on the path. Masala gritted her teeth through the searing pain in her shoulder. Fine, she hissed. Just Fine. Still on her hands and knees, Masala crawled to the back corner and found the latches holding the upper frame down to the main chassis. She unhooked one, and then the other. The upper frame began to lift. What the hell? She heard Neve shout. Keep her steady! Masala instructed as she stood, hoisting the frame up and over the side of the jeep. She watched as it toppled onto the dirt road, rolling violently before smashing hard into the purple trunk of a large, pliant tree. She felt the jeep surge forward, now unburdened by the extra weight. No, Asala said finally. That's better. I think we're losing them, Neil said. Asala planted her hands on the frame of the front cab and steadied herself. She peered at the road ahead, dodging any overhanging branches as they passed. The brush was thick, 
and from this angle it was too hard to see what lay ahead. She dialed down her ear implants, dampening the frequency of the wind and ambient noise around her. New sounds emerged, plucked from that drone of noise. She heard the thrum of their own L Quadro engines, the chirps of aviary life, and in the distance, the rumble of a hover vehicle. Not just one, two. One in front and the other... Coming from right behind them, an ambush. Masala looked back to see a hover schooner swerve out of the thick tree line and onto the dirt path. She could already tell by the rate it was accelerating that it would soon overtake them. Asala raised her arm cannon, a threat to hold the raider at bay, but he raised his own peculiar weapon in return. A typical pistol's nozzle would be a glow with charge by now, but not this one. He fired. An arrow flew past her, the tip embedding itself into the frame of the jeep's cab, barely missing Neef's head. The metal line attached to the arrow stretched taut, and she saw the schooner pull closer, closer. The raider hadn't been aiming for her. He was going to board. Asala pointed her weapon and fired, the charge skirting deliberately right above his head. Back off, she warned, but the raider was undeterred, swinging a weighted rope in a circle over his head. What the hell was he going to do with that? Asala didn't want to find out. Enough with the warning shots. She raised her arm, this time firing a charge directly at him. He dodged out of the way and flung the loop at the end of his rope. It circled around her wrist, an easy target at this angle. Great, she muttered, knowing what was next. The loop cinched tight around her arm. The more she struggled, the more it dug into her skin. The raider jumped onto the flatbed, keeping a tight hold on the line. She lunged after him, throwing a punch with her free fist. He crouched, swaying underneath her arm and back. His eyes weren't quite focused, but his moves were sharp and deliberate. She swiveled, doing her best to track his movements and punched again. But once more, he evaded, while at the same time threading the rope around her over and over until her own arms were caught tight against her body. She was stuck. If you're trying to slow us down, Masala hissed, it's not going to work. He stepped close to her, tightening the slackened rope around the length of his arm to keep her in control. He stared at her through the glass of his dust goggles, his gray eyes like cracking ice. Tell Niamh to stop, he ordered. No one will get hurt. I don't care if I get hurt, Masala said, and she snapped her head forward, the thick of her forehead striking him right in the nose. He stumbled backward, instinctively dropping the rope to suppress the blood dripping out of his swelling nostrils. Asala swept her legs at his ankles, and he fell hard on his side. Moving quickly, she loosened the length of rope around her body and then hastened to tie him down. Wrists first, then ankles. He struggled, but at this point it was no use. She crouched over him with a smug grin. I told you it wasn't going to work. Once she was sure he was bound securely to the jeep's frame, she turned back to the front cab. Leaning over Neve's shoulder, she peered out the front windshield. Good to see you're still alive, Neve said, keeping her eyes on the road. That was a close one. Asala nodded at the harpoon tip, penetrating through the metal, a mere inch away from Neve's ear. Neve adjusted her grip on the wheel, her knuckles now off-white. We're coming up to the field, just 50 meters up beyond that break of trees. Masala honed in on the sounds ahead of them. The engine of her space cruiser was still in lull, which meant the raiders hadn't gone aboard. Seeing how fast the enemy schooners were, their terrain jeep would never be able to close the gap, even with the modified framework. The raiders had too much of a head start. Masala's thoughts whirled about in her head, tracing every single option she had to still succeed. I'll be out back, Masala said in decision. Again? Neve asked. But Asala had already ducked out to the flatbed. Taking a quick glimpse at her prisoner's binds, she kneeled down next to her pack. Her fingers grabbed onto a very familiar handle, pulling out a narrow equipment box. She placed her thumb on a square sensor located on the handle and waited as the box whirred to life. 
Blocks of the casing jutted out in a hiss, folding and refolding as it reassembled into its new form. She stared down at her sniper rifle, a trusted, reliable model that had gotten her gold stars on more than a handful of missions. She hefted the barrel in one arm, pushing the whole unit back to rest against the opposite shoulder. She swung the sniper rifle up on the roof of the front cabin and clicked the legs of the bipod mount down to give her a steady pivot. I see them, Neve called out. They're already boarding the cruiser. Masala looked out into the landing field, watching the last raider disappear through the cruiser's entryway. The door to the vehicle swung shut, the turbines already whirring. She could, if she wanted, take down the turbines, but then her entire cargo would go up in flames, not to mention the raiders inside. The fewer casualties, the better. She didn't really care for most people, but her training did instill a need to protect them. Injuries, however, she could be okay with that. The cruiser was lifting off when her right eye went to the scope, and all she could see were blocks of color shifting from one second to the next. Blue for the sky, purple trees, gray dirt road ahead. Trying to snipe a target on a moving vehicle was not ideal. Finally, she caught the navy and gray digital camouflage design of her cruiser. Up, tilt up, a touch more. The curve of a shoulder, follow that. Down the arm, past the elbow, a hand on the steering wheel, there. She took a deep breath and squeezed the trigger. She heard the charge fly out, whistling in its trajectory. They're hit, Nia called out from inside the cab. Asala looked quickly to see the cruiser swerve downward. It was a scary sight to watch something that large veer toward a collision, but from this height, it would be somewhat minimal. A clipped wing. She was hoping that was the extent of the damage. That was when the cruiser started to turn upright. Asala brought her eye back to the scope, tilting her vision to see a second raider grabbing hold of the wheel. No, no, no! She fired again, desperately this time. The charge buried into the metal of the cruiser. Another hopeless shot, another miss. You're forgetting to breathe, Asala. You're forgetting how to do your job. And she knew then that she'd failed. She threw her rifle down and stared up as the cruiser rose out of firing range and into the clouds. They're getting away, Neef said. She clenched her jaw. I can see that. Neif swiveled so that her eyes caught the daylight. Now what? I track them down. How? We don't know where their camp is. We'll have to call up to orbit for surveillance. Asala shook her head. She didn't want Dio to know of her failures. She could see her older sister's face as she heard the news. A disappointed sigh every time Asala made a wrong choice, made another mistake. We don't meet them. Asala said calmly. She jutted a thumb to the raider tied up in the flatbed. Because we have him. He'll get us to their base camp. Everything that was supposed to build her future was in that cruiser. Stolen away, just like her past. She was a child then. She couldn't fight. But now she had the skills. She had the tools. She could find it all again. Asala tilted her head back up to the sky. She was going to get it all back. You're listening to The Vela Salvation by Maura Milan, starring Robin Miles. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. The Vela Salvation is written by Ashley Poston, Maura Milan, Nicole Givens Kurtz, and Sangu Mandana. It is produced by Rhoda Bilyeza and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith.